Welcome to the Safety Share, a new webinar series brought to you by CIM Magazine and the CIM Health and Safety Society. I am your organizer, Michelle Beacom, Managing Editor of CIM Magazine, and my co-organizer today is Ryan Bergen, Editor-in-Chief of CIM Magazine. Today's presentation is called Implementing Smart Cap Technology as Part of the Torac, sorry, Torex Fatigue Risk Management Strategy. Just a little housekeeping before we get the webinar started. If you joined by computer audio or by computer, please ensure that you have selected the computer audio button. If you dialed in on your phone, please make sure that you have selected the phone button. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into your GoToWebinar control panel uh, question box. We will reserve the questions till the end of the presentation for the Q&A period. Note that there will be a few poll questions during the webinar, so pay attention. Now I will turn the webinar over to Ryan Bergen. Thank you. All right. well, thank you very much, Michelle, and thank you everyone for joining us here today. Um, we're super excited to be partnering with the Health and Safety Society of CIM to be able to bring this series to you. Um, and I'm very happy to have Nelson Bodnerchuk uh, with us to both uh, host today and to help us uh, pull this, uh, this series together. Uh, Nelson is treasurer for CIM's Health and Safety Society and vice president for health and safety at Torex Gold Resources. Nelson. Thanks, Ryan. And thanks to everybody for showing up today and listening in. Um, this series is going to look at uh, various themes throughout the year, uh, from safety at the face in the underground mine to mental health awareness right across the board. I'm looking forward to learning from our guests so I can leverage these ideas in my day job and apply some of the practices that uh, we learn about throughout the year. Um, it's a really selfish reason, but I encourage everyone participating in the call today to get, get a little bit selfish as well. Uh, so every good safety share starts with a compelling story and ends with a call to action. And today's no different. Today's safety share is going to cover um, the story of fatigue risk management at Torex Gold. Uh, and then there's going to be a couple of call, calls to action throughout and at the end to our participants. Um, so to kick off the safety share for 2023 uh, today, I'll be, I have the pleasure of hosting Emily Tetzlaff. And Emily is a PhD candidate at the Human and Environmental Physiology Research Unit at the University of Ottawa and a Health and Safety Project Analyst at Torex Gold. She also happens to be leading the implementation of uh, the fatigue risk, the multi-year fatigue risk management strategy at Torex, um, which includes the smart cap uh, technology implementation in our open pit at this time. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Emily. The floor is yours. Excellent. And I'm just going to confirm that you can see my screen. Good to go. Good to go. Okay, awesome. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And, and thank you for the introduction, Nelson. I'm really excited to be speaking with you all today about the work that we've been doing over the past few years at Torex and how we've integrated the smart cap wearable fatigue detection technology into the site's broader fatigue risk management system. Um, so today we're going to touch on some kind of basics of fatigue in the industry, how fatigue uh, risk management can help us with that, how we can integrate the wearable technology as a, as a component of that system. And then I'm going to share with you, like Nelson said, kind of the story or case study of how we've done fatigue on site from a field research perspective at Torex. We'll then kind of situate where we are now being January 2023 and then where we're going to be heading over the next few years. Uh, and then, as Michelle said, I look forward to any questions you might have for me at, uh, at the end. So first things first, what is fatigue? Why should we care about it? Um, this question kind of sets myself up a little bit because there's no single definition of what fatigue is. Um, and this is because the symptomology and the presentation of fatigue is very so significantly based on the individual and based on the context. Um, but for the purpose of the presentation today and kind of our shared uh, area of interest, we're gonna be viewing fatigue from kind of that cognitive impairment perspective so meaning that we're focusing on fatigue as an altered mental state rather than physical fatigue that would be caused from the more demanding physical exhausting labor now when we're focusing here 
on this type of mental fatigue and why we're doing that is because this is what this is most significant risk is for mobile equipment operators um, in the mining industry and this is for various reasons um, so relative relatively uh, sedentary nature of driving we've got the effect of extended work shifts or just the circadian disruptions that come with shift work in general those swings to days and nights um, and then on top of that we have these factors of moving in a slow uh, slow speed, following the same route continuously, and exposure to what we call environmental uniformity. So on top of all of these kind of occupational considerations, we then have to layer on top all of those individual factors. So a person's age, their lifestyle choices, do they have any comorbidities, and then quite importantly, their, their sleep or their lack of sleep. And so we know that once a, once a worker becomes fatigued because of these occupational factors or personal factors, they're going to have an impaired ability to personally detect their increasing deficits. So this means that their ability to self-evaluate, self-manage, self-mitigate fatigue in any given moment becomes impaired. And all of this is going to place both them and the others around them on site at, at significant risk. So I think we're just going to pop in a poll question here. So just asking about the implementation within systems and different equipment in your workplace. Leave the poll open for another 10 seconds. Okay, awesome. Thanks for completing that. Um, yeah, so we can see the, the results. Here's the, uh, the answers to the poll. Excellent. So we're seeing that we do think that there's some opportunity for better training on their use, greater employee involvement in their implementation. Excellent. So this is a great point because what the case study that we're going to share today really highlights um, getting that employee buy-in um, from, from the front line. So I'm excited to, to show you guys how we've, how we've done that. So flipping back to the slide deck here, um, now the gold standard approach for mitigating fatigue on site and its related risks is through what we call a fatigue risk management system or an FRMS. So this type of system is integrated inside of a site's broader safety management system. So it's just one small component of it, but it's a critical component that unfortunately is often overlooked in the design of safety systems. So there's a ton of different models uh, and approaches to this, but I've highlighted a few kind of really critical components that a fatigue risk management system should include. Um, so one is methods to monitor potential causes of fatigue uh, and having those action plans in place to those then minimize those effects. We'd have identifying personal warning signs of fatigue and appropriate countermeasures adopting and applying effective practices for combating fatigue, and then making sure that we have really strong communication um, for both personal fatigue and site-wide changes to the strategy to all levels uh, within an operation. Now, if we narrow in kind of on that first point of methods to monitor, um, historically, what we've had to rely on is really subjective strategies for operator um, using operator feedback and self-assessment or having our safety coordinators go into the field and do kind of external evaluations. But unfortunately, what happens with that is that we're often resulting in kind of a one-size-fits-all approach to fatigue management. But we know, like I mentioned on the earlier slide, that individual characteristics are a really critical part of personal fatigue disposition. Uh, and therefore, we're going to need personalized strategies to have a greater benefit to worker safety. So thankfully, with recent advancements in technology, we now have a ton of different op options available to us to help measure this fatigue on that individual level. So more specifically, we've got a ton of advancements with EEG technology. Um, so this was formerly only available in really clinical settings and for diagnostic purposes, but we've now uh, seen a translation to field wearability with it. And the real benefit to using EEG technology over other solutions, such as things that monitor blink rates, uh, is that they've got a greater predictive capacity. So other options with the blink rate, you'd already be having a really um, 
close effect to it becoming a micro sleep. So we're going to consider that a lagging indicator for, for fatigue. Whereas with the EEGs, because we're getting um, measurements over time, we can actually predict drowsiness and we can predict that feed fatigue well in advance of a micro sleep taking place. So this is why Torex uh, selected the life band by SmartCap. So it's one of the options that's on the market. Uh, it's owned by Wenco. So this system has a couple different components to it just to situate us to the diversity of the platform. So the first piece is the wearable portion of the system. So it's called the life band. In the image on the right here, you see our operator um, wearing it in the field. So it's just worn as a headband. You can wear it underneath a hard hat, um, depend on, depending on the safety equipment um, required for your site. The second piece of it is uh, the little display that you see in the image on the left that's just been mounted uh, directly into the cab of the truck. Now, inside that life band, inside that headband, we have little EEG sensors uh, and an electronic processing card that's attached to them. And this is wirelessly sending the information or transmitting it in real time to that dashboard display. And then it's also sending it to our dispatch center as well through a life hub system where all of the data is being captured um, and recorded. So the in-cab display is then what's displaying uh, and creating audible interactions with the driver. So the little table that I have popping up on the screen there is showing you the different types of levels a person uh, could be receiving. Now, the fatigue-related warnings and alarms are, are all estimated based on a proprietary algorithm um, patented by SmartCap. So for this, we're just gonna look at the simplistic version of the levels that an operator would be seeing. So a level two and level three would mean that they're uh, operating in, in a good state of alertness, maybe some early indicators of fatigue, but no immediate action required on a level three. Once they're advancing to a level three plus, this means that their fatigue level is potentially rising a little bit. It's an opportunity for them to take some self uh, mitigating action. So maybe eating, adjusting posture, taking a break if it's um, conducive to do so where they are. But once we reach a level four, this is an actual fatigue risk alarm taking place. Uh, and it's, it means that we do need to have some kind of intervention and self-management take place to make sure that we are going to mitigate the fatigue and not allow it to get any further or closer to a micro sleep taking place. Now, on top of these alarms, the operator could also be receiving some non-fatigue statuses. So if they took the life band off, if they lost connection, or if they had a poor fit because their hair was in the way or it just didn't have good connectivity to their skin, they could also receive that feedback to help them tailor their actions appropriately. So the team at Torix, they identified that they that they wanted to bolster their fatigue risk management on site. Um, they identified that SmartCap was a tool that they wanted to approach um, using, but they really wanted to evaluate it systematically and, and field test the device within their own specific and unique work context at the operations in Mexico. So that's when I and a team at the Center for Research and Occupational Safety and Health, which is in Sudbury, Ontario, uh, first partnered together with Torex. And what we did was design a research project um, that could achieve those goals for them. We submitted that to a Canadian granting agency called MyTax that aims to kind of bring together researchers and industry to support uh, these initiatives. So we then it kind of pursued a year-long process because we luckily were awarded the grant. Uh, and with that, we were kind of able to launch the project under three kind of metrics or object objectives guiding us. So first, we wanted to evaluate operator um, acceptance and device usability in the field. We wanted to determine if the SmartCap um, system could help us identify and reduce operator fatigue risk on an individual and crew level uh, basis. And we wanted to determine if the SmartCap system could actually help us improve operator effectiveness at self-management as well. So could it be used as kind of a training aid um, for self-guided behavior? So our method included a couple of uh, really key steps that I wanted to highlight today because I think that they're uh, just really critical and, and great examples of um, the robustness of how this was approached for, uh, through Torex. But first, we we did seek approval from the Laurentian University Ethics Board um, because we wanted to make sure that everything that we did was guided under um, correct ethical approval. We also sought union approval, um, both at the local and the provincial level um, with the labor groups that are represented on site at Torex. 
And of course, we did all of that before the launch of the project in May 2021. Um, two other critical things that we did was that we engaged in a, ri uh, a risk assessment and a change management review. And this was critical because it helped make sure that the implementation wasn't going to pose any additional or exacerbate any existing risks that may already exist on site, and that our management of change would be considered within both this pilot period, but then any subsequent rollouts that we um, decided to do. So for this little pilot, um, we recruited 17 of our operators. They were from three different crews and they were operating five specific Komatsu trucks. Um, and that way we had continuous coverage over um, the entire study period and we constantly had devices in use on site. Uh, we also designed this rollout so that it just completely mirrored the existing shift schedule and we therefore had no disruption to normal operations. And this site follows a 10-10-10, so 10 day shifts, 10 night shifts, 10 days off. And the image there that's showing you, it's kind of showing how this rollout occurred over kind of a 70 day period. But the really interesting thing about how we did it is that we had the operators wear the devices, these life band um, headbands, without any feedback, no audio, no visual feedback for the first 20 days. So 10 days, 10 nights. They then left for their break. And when they came back for the next shift cycle, we activated everything. And so this is what was going to allow us to do that evaluation of self-management um, with feedback against the external feedback to reduce their, their risk, um, which was a cool feature of, of our little design. Um, so we also had our operators complete two different questionnaires, a pre and a post. Um, the pre one was really just to capture demographic details, employment characteristics, uh, and then we looked at six key dimensions that are known for technology acceptance, um, both in and outside of workplace context. So things like does an individual have pers personal um, experience using wearable technology, whether maybe a smartwatch uh, that's doing heart rate or some other piece of technology that they've had in their in their history. Looking at perceived privacy risks, so did they understand the data handling and who was going to be viewing their, their health information? Uh, looking at crew level norms and, and supervisor worker interactions with, the, with this program. And then looking as well at the, did the operator see a perceived value, an occupational need, and was it compatible with their workplace from, from their user perspective? Um, touched on comfort and functionality, so did they feel any concerns with that? And then perceived ease of use as well. On top of this, we also included a validated uh, sleep questionnaire so that we could help identify in advance any sleep disorders that operators may have. So transitioning kind of into the results, I've highlighted here a few things just to kind of showcase to you. Um, but knowing that for simplicity of today's presentation, I'm going to keep it pretty light on the data. Um, but we do have some manuscripts that are coming out in review and another in development that are going to be more robust and, and sharing all of the data with you. So we'd encourage you to read those when they become available. But like I noted, we did collect tons of demographic details, um, all based on factors that are known to have a relationship with fatigue uh, susceptibility. And so we therefore were then able to look at kind of individual operator characteristics or fatigue level. Now, trend data is not available for this pilot because the, it was such a small number of operators being just 17. Um, so no trends existed by age or by sex. Um, at this level, but now that we've got more operators within the system moving forward, um, we're going to be able to look for, for those trends a little bit more closely. With the sleep disorders, this was a really great questionnaire. It just has 50 questions to it. It's really quick for operators to fill out, but it's everything from history with insomnia and sleep apnea, snoring behaviors, um, whether they're showing signs of circadian rhythm sleep disorder, which a lot of shift workers have, um, but no operators within our study uh, had positive indicators on this sleep disorder questionnaire, which was great, but a nice pre-check for us. So, I've also highlighted just focusing in on two of the sections here for the qualitative questionnaire feedback, um, but we really thought that the data related to perceived value, need and advantage was really great to share because it does show the buy-in from our operators. So for example, most of our operators almost immediately felt the device had benefit to the health and safety of our workplace. They felt that the investment should be made for all operators outside of the pilot. 
Uh, they felt that it made them safer, and really importantly, they felt that it actually helped teach them how to better sense fatigue states themselves. Um, so having that feedback and letting them know that this is actually what your mind feels like when you're moving towards a microsleep is was fantastic to see that they saw the value in that. Um, they also re reflected that they thought it was a good solution to fatigue management compared to other strategies that they had maybe seen at other sites or that already existed within Torex. And then for usefulness and ease of use, we also saw just kind of great feedback here as well. Essentially all operators either were neutral to strongly agree that it was easy to use, it required no additional mental effort, which means that it wasn't going to, wasn't acting as a distraction or uh, excess, excess burden while they were operating these um, important pieces of equipment. They also felt that it was improving their workplace safety, their productivity, and that they were going to be willing to continue to voluntarily use it. Of course, because of this part, this portion of it was a research design, um, it was completely optional and voluntary for them to continue to use the device. Um, and so it was great to see that the majority of them were willing to continue that use entirely voluntarily um, without it being considered a, a mandatory piece of PPE for the company. So moving into those kind of metrics and speaking first to operator acceptance. Uh, so to evaluate this, we used what we're calling kind of actual usage. So this means that it's the amount of time that the operator chose to put the system on compared to the 440 ish hours of potential usage opportunity um, and so we'd calculated that by knowing that a standard shift was 12 hours they have a break period in there and then we know the shift rotation of 20 days and so that's how we got to 440 and so this is the percentage of time against that that they chose to wear the device so we had two operators that exceeded 90 percent 13 operators in that 60 to 90 percent um, usage percentage and then two operators that had less than 60 percent. So what's great to see here is that we got really strong buy-in from the get-go for almost all employees but it does pretty clearly show you that you don't get full buy-in from everybody within such a short period so this is less than a two-month period um, and so it really shows that there's continued effort and need to to promote and train and teach the value of a, of a option like this to your workers. Now, the second objective was looking at usability. So for this, we use the uh, hours of fatigue detection that are capable relative to the total operational hours captured. So this value really represents the number of times operators were actually receiving fatigue data compared to um, the connectivity issues or notifications such as like poor fit. So for this, we actually ended up uh, achieving kind of 77% 70, of the time fatigue detection was possible. And so we had some people, same as uh, acceptance, that were on different ends of the spectrum here. We had five that had greater than 90%, which means that they were having really strong connectivity. They were wearing the device really well. It was well um, sized to their heads. And then we had some other operators that had um, more difficulty using the device. Some of these operators had less previous experience with wearable technology, um, so it gave us an opportunity to intervene uh, in that regard. The other thing it helped us do was from a broader site perspective is address any latency concerns. So this is a really rural remote area, um, and so making sure that we were addressing any signal connectivity concerns that might have been adding to these values. Okay, and then for device usability as well, I've just showcased some of the breakdowns here um, that we have looking kind of the crew level trends. So showing you that the vast majority of the time operators are operating in that level two alert status. Um, level three, which is also a great place of alertness, no need to integrate anything yet. And then we do have a few situations where level three plus is, so those warnings and those alarms starting to take place. We also had a decent amount of poor fit, but this was great to see as well because it just gave us opportunity to intervene and give training. Uh, and then we were able to address that uh, pretty quickly. Now for the identification of fatigue risk, um, this data is fantastic because you can break it down in, in so many different ways. But the graph I'm showing you here basically has the days in the shift cycle. So day one to day 10 was be day shifts. And then day 11 to day 20 is the night shift run. And you can see that the number of alarms between days and nights is the same, uh, or is pretty close to the same at 51 to 49%. But you see a really clear peak around day 10, day 11, which 
is completely um, anticipated really because we know that fatigue has kind of that cascading effect to it. So we see the peak on day 10, the last day of the run, and then we have a little bit of an elevation that continues um, over the next couple days as a person's transitioning into getting into that night shift mentality. We were also able to break that down by individual participant. So of the 17, only nine had uh, had alarms take place, uh, but three of, of the operators accounted for the vast majority of those alarms. So identifying that there's potentially some high risk um, for those users that we need to intervene on. We were also able to look at the hour of the day. Um, so the figure on the right there is showing that between kind of one and 3 a.m. we've got a high peak period, uh, which is explained by normal circadian pattern patterns and then day or hours eight and nine which is the start of shift so when someone's just first coming in and getting um, into their day we're having a higher alarm period there we also saw some trends with the days of the week um, so we had more alarms on the weekends this uh we've seen this in the literature as well before where with the weekends there's more kind of competing social demands that are causing an individual to perhaps uh, stay up later than they would get less sleep um, so we might be seeing the effects of that carrying forward into the data now a really neat thing that um, the system does and that uh, with the integration with our hexagon fleet management system we're able to look at the high-risk locations so you're seeing a map there an aerial shot of the site uh, and the numbers that are highlighted are areas where we had more alarms taking place so we had seven during this pilot period seven locations that had the majority of the alarms um, no difference between days and nights at this point um, but when we cross-referenced it to Hexagon, we were able to actually say, okay, what are operators doing at these locations that are going to be causing higher um, opportunities for fatigue? They're idling areas, they're meeting points, they're loading stops, they're dumping locations. So we know that at those points in times, we can add in other interventions. Maybe we can add in lighting, we can add in radio contact between supervisors or dispatchers to help get that cognitive capacity um, a little more engaged. Now, next up for actually reducing fatigue related risk. And so this is a great figure here. We've got the entire study period from day one to day uh, 69 of it. Uh, and you see each crew come on to shift over time. Now for the first half of the graph there, we're seeing kind of higher values. Uh, and that period is the period where the crews had no feedback. So they had no audio, no visual coming into them and they were just self-managing their fatigue on their own. The second half of the data set is where those were then activated and we see an immediate kind of drop um, in that. So just kind of showing the value of that live in cab personalized feedback coming to the operator that's allowing them to um, manage their fatigue personally. So for operator uh, effectiveness at self-managing fatigue here, I've got um, the 20 day period here as well. And basically it's just showing the percentage of effectiveness of early warning. So when you've got that initial warning that's saying, hey, fatigue is pot potentially building, how often were we able to engage in mitigating actions that would decrease the risk of a level four occurring? Uh, and for the vast majority, we were seeing really great um, capacity to, to dissipate, dissipate the risk. Okay, so where are we now? So that all occurred kind of over the summer of 2021. Uh, moving into the fall, we were really diving into the specifics of the data, integrating that with all of the great feedback that we got from operators, supervisors, dispatchers, dispatchers over the fall period. And based on that and presentation to the management team, it was determined that this would be something that we wanted to continue to roll out on site. So moving into 2022, we did a pretty significant expansion project um, where we then brought on in two phases, um, 166 operators and 58 more different vehicles. So we had a first group that came in in early spring and then this fall into December, we grabbed another 88 operators and diversified the pieces of equipment um, that would be engaging in the project. So we're now moving into our new phase here, um, which is where we're kind of trying to widen the scope of this project and get some different types of operators engaged. And eventually moving into 2024, when the site goes underground, we're going to work to add on all of those operators as well. So I wanted to showcase as well how diverse the number of vehicles are that we have in this. So in the pilot period, we just had those five haulage trucks here, um, but we've since been able to install these in 
all different types of drills and graders and dozers and um, blast hole drills as well and excavators. So really great opportunity to show that not just for um, transport or trucking, there it can this can be used in, in tons of different pieces of equipment. So the next phase for us is those personnel transport operators. So this is a, a site that requires a pretty significant commute. So some operators um, use a service provided on site that goes into the local communities. And then we also have airport transport as well for, for workers and for visitors to the site. So knowing that these are transporting critical people, crit uh, the whole site is critical. So we wanna make sure that they're just as safe as the operators that are just operating within the site themselves. So this next expansion is going to really allow us to extend that protection. We also have done a, a pretty robust reporting of, of all of the data from the past year as well. So now that we've added in another 100 and so operators, um, we've been able to do a ton of training with with everybody to strengthen our, our values. So we're now at around 89% for overall usability. This is up from 77% in the pilot, which is amazing. Um, we've Our self-management has gone up to 98%, um, meaning that 98% of the time, if a person receives a warning, they're implementing some kind of behavior that's reducing their risk. Our number of fatigue alarms is down dramatically. Um, we still have some consistency with the days and the times um, that we're having alarms and we still have a subset of operators that are accounting for more alarms than others. So all of this is really critical feedback that really is just allowing us to have opportunities to con continue to grow into 2023. So we've been able to use all of that to design our key metrics for next year, which I've shared with you on the slide. Um, so we're looking at reducing fatigue risks even further from the operator level to the whole site-wide average fatigue status. We're looking at still getting that operator effectiveness even higher um, for all operators to get above it. So we're very happy with the average being as high as it is, but we want all operators to have that same self-management capacity. We want to increase our system utilization. So just getting the, the number of hours up um, and then continuing to do what we can to modify uh, antennas and such on site to reduce any latency and, and system um, challenges. So with those goals as well, we have kind of six kind of actions or strategies that we're doing with it or that using layering into it. So one, like I mentioned, is expanding this fatigue risk management to other high risk units, getting protection for those personnel transporters. We also are working on translating our data, kind of getting that data to action model really um, strengthened. So using Power BI and other software is to ensure that we have constant data going to the right people. So right now we've got reporting that happens twice every single day at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Um, that goes to dispatchers and frontline supervisors. So we're constantly talking about usability. We're constantly talking about fatigue alarms. Um, we've got weekly reporting where our entire safety team sits together and to review it. Um, and then we've got personalized reports as well. So for these operators that are having higher risk um, alarms take place, we can pull individualized reports, go one-on-one -on -one with them with the on-site physician team and, and investigate a little bit further about what we can do for that individual um, in a non-penalty capacity, purely to help them improve their, their wakefulness and their safety. We're also working on developing our own uh, training modules for this within the Torex Academy. Um, so currently uh, we've been using an external group that partners with Wenco SmartCap for the training. Um, we're gonna bring it in house this year and really develop and strengthen our own models that situate SmartCap inside of our fatigue risk management system. And then, like I said, it's a continued effort for enhancing program buy-in um, from all levels of the organization. So we're going to do a series of initiatives and education campaigns. We've got um, different things set up with uh, little, uh, not workbooks, little informational books that go with it for helping to troubleshoot uh, by yourself for safety shares related to it uh, and other targeted campaigns. And then we also are going to be testing some new strategies for fatigue reduction, which is really exciting. So on that, I wanted to share one of the new projects that we have layering into this um, system. So uh, there's new technology uh, that's called Blue Wake. It's a commercially available product that was designed in around 2019 in Canada um, by some researchers at Laval University. And the device essentially uses blue light um, via a little uh, display that you're seeing on the screen there, plugged into the cab of a vehicle um, that just helps to influence the level of alertness of an operator that could be experiencing drowsiness at the wheel. 
So because we already have the smart cap system in place that's doing the monitoring and it has live user feedback, we wanted to layer something else in as well that could help mitigate. So what we're going to do is design, a, we've designed a little project here where we're going to be monitoring at different phases using um, both devices at the same time, one against the other. And that way we can use that live EEG data to look at the value of it for uh, implementation for our entire site. Now we're starting this with our um, personnel transport operators because they leave the site um, property. It gets a little bit trickier with the connectivity for the devices and having um, support from dispatch being able to contact them as readily. So we thought this was a great group to try this with so that they had an added layer when they leave the site um, property line. So we're going to be rolling this out in the spring of this year. Again, the same way, approaching it really systematically with a small group before we um, commit to a site-wide implementation of it. So really excited to see uh, the feedback on that as it comes. Okay, and so that's kind of to the end of the content I had for today. But first, um, before we move to questions, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, two groups. So one being the Center for Research and Occupational Safety and Health. Like I said, at the time when I started into this project, I was a PhD student within that um, research center. So Dr. Sandra Dorman, Dr. Dominic Gagno, and Dr. Bruce Odson um, were the supportive supervisors and the statisticians that assisted us with this project. And then, of course, to acknowledge that My Tax Inc. Um, was the granting agency that helped uh, facilitate this project as well. So I believe we're going to pop in another poll here before we switch to questions. Another five seconds. Excellent. So Nelson, I'm sure is going to be recording that um, so that future yeah, sessions. Yeah. Excellent. Over to you, Nelson. Yeah. Thanks so much, Emily. Great presentation. Um, and it's always fun to dive in on the details on these types of projects, right? Because they are somewhat transformative and they do have, um, when I talk with people about, they go, you're doing what? Uh, and so thanks for leading off this uh, this web series this year for the CIM HSS and, and, and diving right into the details. So again, thanks for the, for the effort you put in the presentation and all the effort you're doing day to day with us uh, in the in the field to help the team uh, design these experiments and implement them in a way that people people are being brought along along the way. So just a reminder to our attendees, um, you can type your questions into the box. I've already seen a few questions um, come in. I'll, I'll read them out loud um, and then I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Emily to answer. Um, I have some other questions myself, but I'm pretty close to this project in particular. Like I said, this is selfish. Um, and thank you for everybody for answering the polls. There's not a bunch of surprises there, but it's it's always good to get that information on uh, on on what others are thinking about and what their needs are. So it'll help us design content moving forward. Um, so let me see if I just bring this front and center. Now I've been looking down at the the questions as they come in. Uh, okay, I have a question here, Emily, that says, have you seen any reduction in incidents or injuries that correlates with the implementation of the technology? Okay, great question. Um, so to date, since we've had the device in play for both during the pilot period and uh, through the broader expansion through the open pit, um, we haven't had a single uh, fatigue related incident take place. Um, which is fantastic. So we don't have any injuries or incidents to report on it. Um, from the perspective of near misses, we shared that we, we've had some high risk alarms that take place, but again, those are in advance of a micro sleep even, even occurring. Um, so really predictive in that capacity. So we have had zero <laughs> fatigue related um, incidents and injuries take place, which is fantastic. Now, 
historically, like many sites, um, data related to fatigue is really hard uh, because it's not always been implemented or been um, a testable feature of an accident investigation. So it's kind of a challenging comparison to make to historic data. Um, but we now have kind of this record going forward so that we're going to be able to, in five, two years, five years from now, um, have an extremely robust data set to look at to look at trends and if any accidents um, take place and we have to investigate, we can use this as a tool uh, integrated into that um, pro protocol. But so I guess we've seen a re redu reduction to zero, but we don't really know the true value at which we were starting from. I guess would be the shorter answer. Thank you for the question. Great. Uh, here's there's a couple of coming in here, so I'll I'll try to. There's two here. Um, did you find any operators were ticked off because they couldn't get their hour nap in particular underground um and then the the question goes on but this is perhaps more of a canadian than mexican thing and differently uh you know from an operation operation it could differ right uh so i guess the other the other piece of the question here is can an operator take uh, a penalty free nap Number one, and how does this data factor into bonus calculation schemes, future plans, or integrating, you know, integrating these into some of the HR systems and compensation related systems? Okay. Um, so beginning with the first one, uh, for operators possibly being ticked off for napping, we haven't had uh anybody refused to engage in this program to date. Um, we've had some people that were a little bit skeptical uh, during the first training sessions, but we have not had a single operator um, refuse use of it. And I think that's partly because of how well the on-site representatives, so the safety coordinators, the on-site physicians have done at teaching it, um, or having operators approach it as that it's in addition to their personal protective equipment, the same way that you're wearing a hard hat and and reinforced safety boots and and coveralls to protect you. This is just a layer that's been added on to that. So it's not been it's not we've not had any, anyone refuse to use it. Uh, and as for napping, um, if they choose to nap while they're wearing it, say they're at a safety stop, and th then they'll get alarms and they'll be woken back up from their from their nap. Um, but I don't think we have had any reported case of, cases of that occurring for us. We have, however, uh, had prescribed naps um, been given. So we've had some operators on site that had repeated high risk um, alarms take place. So maybe they received a whole series of them within um, a 10 minute period. And so their dispatcher and their supervisor work together to pull them off the road and then they get um, a prescribed nap essentially. So they go somewhere on site um, that would be safe for them to do so and then they can get some recuperative rest. Um, so really the exact opposite, there's no penalty for napping, but there could be um, prescribed napping instead. But again, that would be site specific, of course, underground at most sites in Canada, I believe it's prohibited um, to purposely fall asleep. So depending on the context, of course, we don't want someone sleeping in the cab of a vehicle because of someone moved and they can knock something in the cab can or the vehicle could be in motion. We want to avoid all of that. But when safe to do so, pulling someone from the road to do a prescribed nap is OK for our site. Um, and, and then kind of of leads, oh, I was just going to say that kind of leads to the next few questions here, Emily, actually, if, unless you want to see something else. No, I was just going to uh, So then the other one was, can an operator take a penalty a penalty? penalty-free nap. I think you answered that in the question. The last, so the last the person, that, I was going to say Go the ahead. last part of the question here though I think was about incentive programs. Um, we we haven't currently necessarily talked about that from the operator level. Um, we do have some um, from the safety perspective. So for our coordinators and our on-site um, physician team, we do have um, some metrics that we look to them to to help us achieve um, so that this whole site is safe, safer. And that I believe is um, slightly embedded within their personal programs. Um, but from an operator level at this site, that's not something we've had to address yet, um, but would be a, cr a great thing to reflect on. So I'll, I'll do some thinking on that one. Great. So I'm trying to I'm trying to move you along here because I'm watching the time. That's why I'm uh, jumping in. But uh, what what were some of the interventions put in um, for the the three level four participants? If you could give us some insight on that. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So for the operators, um, even just from the pilot, the three operators that had higher risk, um, they went for one-on-one -on -one meetings with the on-site physician team. So we've got, um, I think, four or five physicians that, that operate on the site. And so they went in for consultations with them to look at kind of personal backgrounds. So are we having, um, maybe someone has a new baby in their life and it's crying a lot at night and they're getting disrupted sleep. And so we know that um, that's going to be a risk factor for them. Maybe someone is in a really high stress state and because of that, they're having disrupted sleep or whatever it might be. So really getting kind of some context to that individual. Maybe they're doing something different with their behavior. Are they trying to quit smoking and they have a greater level of agitation, whatever it may be. Um, and so from there, we can create kind of a personalized action plan and that's, that's what was done. Um, so giving them advice as well on how can we modify our sleeping environment at home? So can we add in noise cancellation? Can we add in light mitigation? Um, so that was a big part piece of it. Uh, and then knowing and flagging those operators with the supervisor and the dispatcher so that when we see them operating in the vehicle, we know that we can help them intervene better. So they're kind of flagged in the account that they could need additional support, being that um, we're going to call in and radio into them more, period, um, more frequently during the day so that we can help prompt them for hey, now's a great time for a break. Hey, I see we're getting more fatigued. Let's um, drink water. Let's get out of the cab of the truck and walk around. When safe to do so, let's change and do some postural adjustments. So they get a little bit more of a tailored program like that. And then we've not needed to do it yet, but there is a plan in place that if somebody was showing really significant signs, um, then they would be um, recommended to go for sleep testing. Uh, but again, I'd like to cap all of that by saying that um, there's no penalty for receiving a fatigue alarm. Um, no one gets in trouble. It doesn't go in a bad record book. You're not flagged as an unsafe worker. Um, it's really done so from, we wanna help you improve whatever lifestyle or, or occupational feature that we need to, um, to make this a safer work environment for you as an individual operator. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for that. I'm gonna keep um, moving through these questions here, but what, what indicates uh, sleep deprivation in the EEG? is the next one. So, so that one's a little bit harder to answer because of there's components of the algorithm that I am not privy to as because I'm, I'm not with with Wenco. Um, but they on their website, my best advice would be but it's a, a stronger answer. Um, on their website, they do have components of it described. But essentially, how our brain is looking at how our brain waves work. So we know we've got different speeds of brain waves. When we move towards delta brain waves, those are our slowest brain waves. That's when we're in our deepest form of sleep. So when we know we have active waves and we're progressing to those slower, it's basically capturing time points um, and using kind of time domain calculations to determine if we're having a slowing over time and a transition to um, deeper sleeping waves. That would be the a short a short way to describe it but i would encourage to explore the algorithm descriptions on their website and and what i love about it is it, it's it's more proactive right it catches before the eyes start moving and it's it's really up ahead of time so yeah it's, I, estimated, it's it, estimated around seven to eight minutes in advance of a micro sleep is a level four alarm so a level five alarm doesn't even exist in the system because that would be a reactive alarm um so that's yeah that's part of why we we loved it so much was that it was proactive yeah, great. I uh, there's there's something here about thanks for taking the question. Looking forward to the answer in the future. Um, once you've we've gone into more details on that end, um, I would I'm going to jump to uh, one about the band because I get this one a lot in the field as well. Um, so for Emily, um, are you looking at integrating the headband into a hard hat or can that be done? It can be done. Um, it can be done either just wearing the headband around your head and the hard hat on top of it, or I believe their um, smart cap has a couple different iterations of the band, I believe. Um, and so there is a way where it's just basically the front portion of it and it is inside the lip of the, of the hard hat. Um, so both are completely doable. The other feature of the bands, because of course we have to pay attention to the hygiene with this as well. Um, so you're sitting there all day, potentially in a dusty environment. Um, so we to help with that, SmartCap actually created some sheaths um, that can get pulled on and off of the band so that that can be washed daily um, or at the operator's self-perceived hygienic frequency. Um, and so that was another feature that was added in to help both with hygiene and comfort 
um, with the operators because um, everyone's got a different shaped forehead. Um, so some people have um, differing levels of comfort with it. Excellent. And I'm just going to jump ahead a little bit for there's a new question that just came in as, as part of the study, are you exploring identification of possible medical conditions that may cause fatigue, such as cardiac ailments or things like that? Yeah, absolutely. We asked about, um, I think our list was about 20 deep um, for comorbidities. And uh, for this site, I think we had one or two operators that perhaps had type 2 diabetes, uh, a couple with arthritis, um, but nobody with um, specific diseases or existing diagnosis of sleep-related disorders. Um, so uh, for this small pilot that, we're, that we have the data showing for, we didn't have any. I'd like to say as well that those questionnaires, we've continued them with our entire sites. Um, so we've kept those as embedded pro parts of the fatigue risk management program so that we have that data constantly. So if we do have to do a one-on-one -on -one consultation, we can pull that with it uh, and make sure that it's still up to date and uh, applicable to their, to their current living situation. Um, yeah. Okay, here's another question from a, from a technical standpoint. Does the device and notifications work underground? They're supposed to. I don't. We don't have personal experience yet with it, and what the concerns would be for latency. So um, I can't personally speak to it. But in our in our early conversations that we're having with SmartCap about the movement of Torx as operations underground in 2024, 2025, um, it's been discussed that it's a, a option available to us. Um, so I'm not sure what that looks like. I'm not sure if there's a delay that happens on the um, the live features of it, but definitely even when a live feature is not available because someone's left or gone to an area of site that loses connectivity, the that all of the data is still being recorded. It's just not gone back to the system immediately. Um, so it could be that it's in that way it would be a little bit um, Actually, they still get the in-cab displays for it. It just wouldn't go to dispatch for supervisor level intervention. Um, so I can't speak to it personally because we've not seen it yet, but my knowledge is that it's entirely possible. Okay, great. I'm gonna keep moving along here. We've got a, a few more questions here. So has the research determined an increase or, or increase the use of artificial stimulants? So things like energy drinks, caffeine, things like that to fight the fatigue? So we, in our first question, in the, in the questionnaire, we do ask about caffeine consumption and energy drink use. Um, but because we haven't done, we haven't finished the analysis between the 2022 data that has the 100 plus operators against their lifestyle features, we haven't been able to look at how those individual modifiers would affect the data quite yet. Um, it's another layer that we're gonna be adding into it so that we can have um, better characteristics we don't want people to be engaging in in strategies that maybe in in a short term work but in the long term have either other health consequences or are going to delay your capacity to go to sleep that night so we know caffeine has a six to eight hour half-life associated to it so if we have someone who's getting those alarms at um, our high risk period they're at one to two in the morning uh, they're consuming caffeine and then they try and go home to go to sleep because they're on nights um, we don't want that because that's going to disrupt the sleep and then they're coming into the workplace with a carryover effect of accumulated fatigue um, so it's a great question and it's another layer that we need to figure out using those power bi and using those softwares how we can get individual reports of it layered in with our um, data yeah because there's there's a lot of data coming in there so this one's more of a diagnostic question. I think it, it hits two of the questions that have been asked around circadian rhythms being interrupted and, and um, interventions that we, we use. But have we used the tech? Have you used the tech for mitigating that risk, like from a diagnostic standpoint, to show that um, the risk is being mitigated and that it actually hasn't proceeded, like where we're not going to proceed past the, the need of the technology? So for instance, you know, you're using oh, it as a self-manage yeah so are we self-managing that's really what that comes down to yes yeah, so we have some operators that yes that they have been able to 100 percent um either remain in levels two and three so full alert status or only get level three pluses once or twice in the course of a shift and are 100% of the time that they receive those warnings are able to self-manage. So for some people, 100% um, capacity to self-mitigate fatigue. 
other individuals we're, we're seeing um, have a different learning curve with it uh, and perhaps need to engage in other strategies that we'll continue to test. But yes, we have 100% seen um, that change happen for some people. So in the data, you've seen that increase in self-management at the lower yeah. level. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this one's covering off a big topic as well. Um, so did you use or can you see using, um, you know, buy-in incentives um, for using these team-wide? And have you received any pushbacks uh, from a perspective of like personal rights intrusion or privacy related issues with respect to the data? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so two parts to the question there. Uh, we have not had to use any buy-in incentives um, with the operators. It's just for us, it's not been necessary because uh, I think because it's been trained in a way that's showing that the value is home safe. Um, the value is that you are working in a way that you're also leaving work with a higher level of fatigue um, because it's helping you learn about your rest to work cycles. It's helping you learn about recuperative and restorative um, sleep. So I think more operators, we have it in our data with the questionnaire that they feel that they're doing lifestyle improvements as well beyond the workplace. Um, so for all of those factors, we've not needed to use to use buy-in incentives. Could they be appropriate for some workplaces? Maybe. Um, I think the better sell is safety itself um, than needing to incentivize it personally. Um, then the other part of that question was, remind me the, sorry, remind me the tail, I only wrote down the first half of it. Can you remind me the yeah, tail end? No, that's no problem. It's really around the, the privacy, the usage of data, and ultimately yeah. there's another question that came in a little bit differently, but it's along the same lines is like the ethical concerns operators may have with respect to supervisors and management using that data for other purposes. Like, are they gonna get punished for being tired? Or um, how, you know, what what happens with that data at the end of the day if, if there aren't any fatigue alarms and, you know, where does it go? And all those concerns yeah. around, you know, you're measuring my brain waves, what are you doing with that, right? Yeah, Do absolutely. That? Yeah, so that's part of why we wanted to keep um, within the technology acceptance model, um, we, why we wanted to keep the privacy risk concern questions um, and that we continue to use with all of the operators as the project rolls forward, uh, was to make sure that we were mitigating any concerns as they came up about data handling, about is this actual health data um, and such. And so during the two, two approaches to it, during the study portion, everything we did was entirely de-identified um, as it needed to be for, for ethics of a research study. And so the data handling was minimized, everything was de-identified, and the data that we use from it is not, by the time it gets to our data management, is not raw EEG signals. So it's a secondary version of it, right? Because it's been translated to these um, this alarm system of one through five. So we set up a pretty, moving forward beyond this, beyond the study, we set up a pretty rigorous process where it's the on-site physicians who are regulated by um, the Mexican version of, of our Health Protection Act. Um, and so they're responsible for legally applying to that as licensed physicians. Uh, and then for our safety coordinators and supervisors and dispatchers that are engaged in it, they all have received training as well about how we're handling this as a company. Uh, that's been integrated with our human resources team that's reviewed the process, um, specifically how we use it within an accident investigation as well to ensure that there's no penalty to the operator. We've done some things like a sunset, a sunset clause as well, where um, you, after a certain period of time without having any any alarms taking place, um, you're no longer deemed to be kind of at higher risk for it. So we've tried as best as we can to reinforce that to everyone that's involved in, in touching the data from this, that that's the intent. The intent is for safety. The intent's not for penalty. Um, yeah. yeah, I'll leave there. Okay. And, and conversely, somebody just commented, uh, it's important to note, and I think this person's with Wenco or SmartCap, um, no medical information is connected, collected by SmartCap um, or the SmartCap device itself, right? It's really just yeah, measuring. It's just the going. operator's name, and then we keep the rest of this demographic data entirely separate and, and confidential. Yeah. So we've hit our time for today. I'm, I'm noticing we've got about one to two minutes left on my clock. Um, so the questions that we didn't get to as they come in, um, we'll be forward to Emily and, and she'll respond to them in due time. Um, yeah. And if you have further questions, you can either reach out to Emily or I after this, or if you're watching a recording of this, you can reach out to both of us uh, at our email addresses on the screen. 
Um, and, and finally, if you've got a topic uh, for me to cover in the next uh, one or two series, we've got a little bit of a plan moving forward, but we're going to call audibles throughout the year. Um, so if you've got a topic that you'd like us to cover or you'd like me to cover, I'd love to hear from you so you can send me your feedback to the, again, I think my email is on the screen here. If I'm, or anyway, we'll, we'll make sure that they did, that data gets sent out with, uh, with any uh, further LinkedIn posts. So um, I think we're getting, we're getting the, the pull off here too, because we're at the last minute as well. So I'll turn it back over to Michelle and Ryan to close us out. And uh, thanks again for the participation, folks. We were right to the hour. So. Excellent. Thanks, Nelson. And thank you, Emily. I'd like to thank all of our attendees and ask that you please fill out the very short survey that pops up on your screen at the close of the webinar. A link to the video recording of this webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow. We hope to see you at our next Safety Share webinar, tentatively scheduled in March. So watch your social media channels for it. You can also find a listing of the, the Safety Share webinars and all of the latest CIM virtual events on our calendar of events at cim.org. Thank you very much, everybody, and we'll see you at the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Take care.